Are you all in class? Ah? Hi, Doc. Not yet, Doc. Not yet, Pa. Nalit kami business, Doc. Nalit ka mo na traffic. Nalit kami dismiss na mo sa nga subject. Ang gumag, na traffic mo. Murag na traffic, Doc. Na traffic sa kalinipawan. Na traffic. Uwan mang go, Doc. Di ha? May mga kayong weather din eh. Sa amuwa. Tuts ki. Sa way man. Sana all. Sana all. Pasaway mas to ski. Sag kayo ko rin to? Ako ba? Oh, pwede na ito mag-start? Yes, no. Okay. So, we'll have chapter 12, Biologic Oxidation. All right. It says here, chemically oxidation is removal of electrons or removal of hydrogen. Now, from a reduced substrate, you remove the hydrogen from that reduced substrate or reduced compound, then that compound becomes oxidized. And the opposite is reduction. The gain of electrons or when it is hydrogenated. Okay. <clears throat> so we are talking now of free energy change. It says it is proportionate to the tendency of the reactants to donate or accept electrons. Now, it is possible in an analogous manner to express it numerically as oxidation reduction or redox potential. Chemically, the redox potential is usually compared with the potential of hydrogen electrode at zero volts no, at zero pH. But you know, <clears throat> our organ system is pH seven. So this hydrogen electrode has a potential of negative 0.42 volts because this is seven. Okay, this is pH seven. If it is pH zero, then voltage zero also. Okay, <clears throat> all right, let's go further. Now these are <clears throat> some of the redox potentials of a uh, special redox copole. So it's a copole. Like for example, what is the copole here? 
the couple is this is your <clears throat> this is this is your reduced couple uh, oxidized couple I'm sorry this is the oxidized couple of hydrogen and this is the reduced that is oxidized in AD that is reduced in ADH. Uh, oxaloacetate, this is oxidized. If it is reduced, it becomes malate. No? Okay, fumarate, oxidized, reduced, succinate. Cytochrome B, Iron, oxidized, ferric, reduced, ferrous. No? Okay. Then you go down to water, oxygen, oxidized, water is reduced. Okay. And so these are the voltage. All right. Now, Responsible for oxidation reduction reaction are your class one enzymes, which you call your oxido reductases. There are four oxido reductases. We have oxidases, dehydrogenases, hydroperoxidases, and oxygenases. So there are only four. So class one oxidoreductases composed of four oxidases, dehydrogenases, hydroperoxidases, and oxygenases. All right. So let's look at oxidases. Oxidases are enzymes that incorporate as you can see here, uh, half molecule of oxygen to have this hydrogen here to form water. Or the acceptor of your hydrogen is one half molecule of oxygen. This is one class of oxidases where it uses only a half molecule of oxygen or one atom of oxygen. There's an oxidase which, of course, uses the full molecule or two atoms of oxygen to receive the hydrogen here and you form hydrogen peroxide. H2O2, okay? That's your oxidases. Example is a cytochrome oxidase. Cytochrome oxidase is found as the last enzyme in your respiratory chain or electron transport chain. It is a heme protein, no? It is a heme protein. All right, this is responsible for, responsible for uh, <clears throat> where uh, your molecule of oxygen, one atom of that is used to accept the hydrogen that has been removed from oxidation of substrates and to form water. This is also called Warburg's enzyme. Warburg enzyme. Okay. It is also known as cytochrome AA3. And 
God bless. And it is uh, blocked or inhibited by known poisons, carbon monoxide, cyanide, and hydrogen sulfide. So H2S, CN, and CO, carbon monoxide. No? Okay. Other oxidases are flavoproteins, meaning to say uh, a component flavin. And flavin is taken from your vitamin riboflavin, vitamin B2. No, your vitamin B2 is member of your, what you call your B complex family. So flavin. So there are two types of that flavin where it uses uh, one adenine, so it is flavin, no? FMN, FMN, okay? If there are two, if there are two, you have your FAD. So you have two FMN and FAD. Okay. Examples of those are L-amino acid oxidase. Right. <clears throat> Function is to deaminate your naturally occurring L-amino acids. Then we have xanthine oxidase, which is responsible for converting purines to uric acid. Aldehyde dehydrogenase is present in mammalian livers, which contains a metal molybdenum, a non hem iron. So iron and molybdenum without your him. Okay. <clears throat> dehydrogenases. Dehydrogenases perform two main function. Okay. Now, as you can look at this figure here, you have a reduced substrate in which the hydrogen has been removed and you have a carrier which accepts the hydrogen and give it to uh, this is your oxidized substrate B, which accepting the hydrogen becomes reduced, substrate B. All right. Now, it does not mean that the dehydrogen is here, is the one working in here also. No, this is specific for this substrate. And this one is specific also for this compound as a substrate. See? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so there are large numbers of enzymes in the dehydrogenases. Their two main functions are as follows. Transfer of hydrogen from one substrate to another in a cobalt oxidation reduction reaction. All right. Number two, transfer of electrons in the respiratory chain of the electron transport from substrate to oxygen. We will see that later when we take up 
the respiratory or the electron transport chain. Okay. So this is your NAD. This is your niacinamide. Oh. Then into nicotinamide. And then to adenine. To adenine residues. That's an adenine there, there's another adenine here. And of course, phosphates. So that is your NAD. Now sometimes this NAD has a phosphate. And it becomes NADP. So we have here vitamin niacin which is converted into uh, nicotinic acid and becomes aminated to become nicotinamide. Now when I say in nicotinic acid, that does not mean that it comes from nicotine. Nicotinic acid comes from niacin, a member of the vitamin B complex again. No? So your vitamin B complex are actually converted to coenzymes. So these are two coenzymes, NAD and NADP. Okay, so you can see it here now. Here is a substrate that is reduced. Okay. And you have your coenzyme NAD. And this is NAD, oxidized NAD, becomes now reduced NAD after accepting these two hydrogens that has been removed. So those are the two hydrogens there. Okay. Oxidation and reduction of your nicotinamide coenzyme. Other dehydrogenases, instead of using NAD, uses FMN or FAD. So you have FAD. Similarly, these two hydrogens are removed and your oxidized FAD becomes now reduced FAD. Okay, so there are many examples of this uh, dehydrogenases using FAD and FMN. Now cytochromes can be also regarded as dehydrogenases. Your cytochromes are heme proteins. They have heme and iron, and the iron oscillates from oxidized to reduced, ferric to ferrous. Okay, because as you remove your hydrogen, electrons goes with it. Okay, and so the iron now gets those electrons. Huh? Okay. During your oxidation and reduction. All right, there are several cytochromes. Your respiratory chain has cytochrome B, cytochrome C1, cytochrome C. And the last cytochrome of the respiratory chain, cytochrome AA3, the cytochrome oxidase, also known as Warburg enzymes. Uh, I am emphasizing Warburg enzyme because 
several times it comes out in the board exam. Instead of telling you it is cytochrome A A3, they are using Warburg enzyme. Okay. All right. Hydroperoxidases use hydrogen peroxide or an organic peroxide as substrate. Hydroperoxidases, there are two of them, peroxidases and catalase. Hydroperoxidases play an important ro role against the harmful effects of reactive oxygen species or what you call ROS. Uh, they are highly reactive uh, compounds. So it has to be destroyed or it needs to have what we call antioxidants because these ROS are very strong oxidants. It can damage the cells, it can damage the organelles. And effects of usual effect of uh, reactive oxygen species is cancer here. And atherosclerosis, why? Because it damages the intima of the blood vessel. And when the intima of the blood vessel is damaged, it becomes rough. And when it is rough, as the platelets passes through that particular area, it is going to burst and starts what we call blood clotting. So we have there a clot inside your blood vessel and it blocks the flow of, of, of your blood so that the tissue or the cells that are supposed to be uh, <clears throat> supplied by the blood, the blood cannot go there anymore. The blood that carries nutrients and especially oxygen, okay? And it can also has in the aging process. No? Can also has in the aging process. All right. Examples of peroxidase, as you have it here. A peroxidase acts on your hydrogen peroxide, utilizing a reduced substrate here and forms water and oxidized substrate. Uh, this is your glutathione peroxidase. Glutathione peroxidase, which <clears throat> it has uh, selenium as its prosthetic group and catalyze the removal or uh, degradation of your hydrogen peroxide and also uh, lipids that has been oxidized hydroperoxides, lipid hydroperoxides through the conversion of a reduced glutathione to become a, an reduced glutathione to become oxidized. So your glutathione is an antioxidant. Huh? Okay, so the catalase works this way. It acts directly on hydrogen peroxide without any helper and converts it into two molecules of water and releasing oxygen. So there are two hydrogen peroxide you 
one as a substrate and the other hydrogen peroxide as an electron donor, no? an oxidant or electron uh, acceptor so that you form now two molecules of water. It is one of the fastest enzymatic reactions known, destroying millions of potentially damaging hydrogen peroxide molecules per second. Then you will ask, where did this hydrogen peroxide come from? Now in our oxidation of our nutrients, we form hydrogen peroxide. We know hydrogen peroxide is toxic. No? In fact, this is the weapon of the macrophages. My, uh, you know macrophages engulfs bacteria. Right? Now, what do they do when they engulf the bacteria? The macrophages produces hydrogen peroxide inside and kills the bacteria that they have engulfed. So therefore, hydrogen peroxide can also be used to kill organisms. Now, in fact, if you ask Dr. Rapaloma, they are an alternative medicine. They use hydrogen peroxide for treating patients with dinghy. No. It destroys the uh, virus by the use of hydrogen peroxide. How much of the hydrogen peroxide? It is very, very minute, very, very small dosage. <clears throat> Okay, so hydrogen peroxide can be both detrimental and can also be used as a weapon. Oh. Now oxygenases, they catalyze the direct transfer and incorporation of oxygen into a substrate molecule. Okay. So they add oxygen directly to the substrate. Uh, Two-step reaction. First step, oxygen is bound to the enzyme at the active site. Now, I do not know why they always use this active site. This because you can be mislead. Around the enzymes, there are several active sites, but there is only one catalytic site. The oxygen is bound to the enzyme at the catalytic site, the site where the substrate binds to the enzyme to form what you call your AS complex, enzyme substrate complex. Because no reaction will happen unless the substrate is bound to the enzyme, AS complex. So just think that this active site is catalytic site. The bound oxygen is reduced or transferred to the substrate. Oxygenases have two subgroups, dioxygenases and monooxygenases. Dioxygenases, two atoms or a molecule of oxygen is added to the substrate. Monooxygenases, it is half molecule or one atom of oxygen is added to the substrate. Okay, here is your dioxygenases. You look at this, you have a substrate and oxygen is added. Two atoms are incorporated. While your monooxygenase 
it says you have this substrate you have this oxygen you have another reduced substrate no and you remove this hydrogen all right and it becomes now an oh so hydroxylated this substrate is hydroxylated aoh one of the hydrogens <clears throat> one, one one hydrogen here forms the oh and the two hydrogens from this another reduced substrate is formed into water so where are the two oxygen here and here because that is o2 here so one oxygen here another oxygen here and you have now an oxidized substrate z okay so we have deoxygenase, dioxygenated incorporate both atoms. Oh, the basic reaction catalyzed is shown below. Monoxygenase is also known as mixed function oxidase, hydroxylase. So it acts as a hydroxylase, forming a hydroxyl. Look at that. So that's a mixed function as an oxidase and as a hydroxylase at the same time. Now this cytochrome P450 are monooxygenases, very important in steroid metabolism and for the detoxification, not only of drugs, legal or illegal, but also foreign compounds or xenobiotics. Xenobiotics that gets into your body. All right. And this is mostly found in the liver because your liver is the seat of detoxification. Anything that is uh toxic is being detoxified in the liver so that's very very important function of the liver and i hope you should not destroy your liver no now when you are young you do not think of uh, destroying your body because you think you are superman and you try to poison your body little by little by drinking alcohol or uh, smoking cigarette. Huh? <clears throat> so your liver will have to suffer. And if it suffers, then it cannot do its very important function and that is detoxification. And of course, you will meet your creator early, no? So you'll meet your creator early in life. All right. Uh, these are the cytochrome P450 because this cytochrome P450 is what we call uh, enzymes that belongs to have uh, a group of enzymes known as uh, enzymes having so many isozymes no? or we call this uh, a super family of enzymes super family it's very very important for detoxification so we will take this up 
when we take up the chapter on xenobiotics, uh, xenobiotics, because now, uh, before in the early days, life was very simple. All, all our, all our diet comes from nature. But now, because of our technology, we have modified. And in the modification of the food, we add uh, additives. One of the additives is, of course, the one that preserve the food, a preservative. And this is, of course, seen in our canned goods. Uh, canned goods. All right. So you have preservatives there. And these preservatives are considered as foreign compounds. And they belong to what we call xenobiotics. And your liver heart will have a problem trying to detoxify these preservatives. And not only that, there's a large number of pollution, not only pollution in your food, pollution from the uh, atmosphere because we always try to poison our surroundings. We always try to poison our surroundings. <clears throat> Insecticides that are being sprayed on our vegetables, antibiotics that are given to our animals that we use as food. So all of these are all pollution. And you should thank your liver that you're still alive because your liver is responsible for destroying or detoxifying all these toxic materials that we put into our food, we put into our atmosphere, so there you are. So let's continue. We will talk about this in Cenobio in the chapter of Xenobiotics. Now here is a very good enzyme in which we produce superoxide dismutase. A superoxide is auto negative. No? Auto negative. It's a free radical. And this is very, very destructive. This superoxide free radical. <clears throat> and you thank your creator that your creator put in you the ability to form an enzyme, superoxide dismutase, abbreviated as SOD. The enzyme is responsible for removal of anaerobic organize, organism uh, and these superoxides that are formed. In our metabolism of certain foods, superoxides are formed. But thanks to this enzyme, it is located uh, all over your body, meaning several tissues has this so that it can defend itself from the attack of superoxide radicals. Oh, here it is. 
this is formed in our body. So enzyme, a flavin enzyme, no? plus oxygen, oxidation, reaction, then they produce superoxide, auto-negative here. Your superoxide can reduce that and you form your oxygen back. And of course, the cytochrome here becomes reduced. So can be removed by superoxide dismutase. We'll have a very good discussion about superoxide dismutase when we take up xenobiotics. All right, let's go to the next. So after chapter 13, after uh, we'll call it a day and uh, another lecture will follow. No? But I guess at four o'clock, there's another lecture still in biochemistry. But it, it will not be me that will be uh, lecturing. Okay, so we have respiratory chain. This occurs in the mitochondria. Okay. And its main function is to produce ATP. Most of the ATP are formed in the mitochondria. And that is why the mitochondria is known as the powerhouse of the cell. Okay. <clears throat> Through a process which we call oxidative phosphorylation. There is another type of phosphorylation, formation of ATP, not through oxidation, but rather from a high energy phosphate compound, that high energy phosphate is given off to ADP to become ATP. And we call that substrate level phosphorylation. Uh, we will go into that when we take up our metabolic pathways because that is where most of your uh, substrate level phosphorylation occur, okay? Especially in your glycolysis. Okay. Now, a number of drugs like amobarbital, this is a barbiturate, Poisons like cyanide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen peroxide no, can inhibit oxidative phosphorylation. With, look at this. <coughs> so it can bring death. <coughs> <coughs> okay. <coughs> Several uh, inherited defects of mitochondria, especially those found in your respiratory chain. You know, can present uh, uh, diseases, but as we said, this is very rare. This is rare occurrence. All right. <clears throat> oh, here we are. This is the location of your respiratory chain.
kena pegawak. Oh. Okay. Are you are familiar with this already? Now this is a schematic diagram of your uh, mitochondrion. No, it is having two membranes: outer membrane and an inner membrane. In between the two membranes is a space. You call it intermembrane space. Okay. Now, the inner <clears throat> the inner membrane is thrown into folds like that. Uh, as we said, this is this is just a schematic diagram. Huh? It really does not look like this when you have a power microscope, electron powered microscope. Uh, it will look like that. So if you are going to stretch out the inner membrane, it will be longer than the outer membrane because of this. Okay? It's projections. Christy. Huh? Okay. All right. The inside of your membrane uh, inside of your mitochondria here, this is known as the matrix. This matrix contains the enzyme for your Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, beta oxidation, and your pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, so it is here. This is where you have your citric acid cycle over here also. Now, on the surface of your inner membrane are enzymes for your respiratory chain, okay? Enzymes. Enzymes of the inner membrane include electron carriers or we are called electron transport chain. You have complexes one to four, and your ATP synthase and membrane transporters. That is what is located in your inner membrane. All right. Now, the component of your inner of your uh, respiratory chain. If let us say this is your respiratory chain. It does not mean that it will run the whole, the whole inner membrane. This is one set of respiratory chain or electron transport chain. Then you will have another over here. Then another, another set. Then another set. So several respiratory chain sets inside the mitochondria. All, of course, are producing ATP. Okay? All right. The respiratory chain oxidizes, reducing equivalence and acts as proton pump. So what do you mean by reducing equivalence? No. Okay, so let's try to look for that. Oh, here we are. So this is where this is the food that you eat. It's composed of fat, carbohydrate, and protein. You swallow it. It goes into your digestive tract. Digestion and absorption occurs in your digestive tract. Of course, that includes the stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. Now, uh, digestion first occur where? The first 
uh, organ of digestion. Where can you find that? Mouth, dog, mouth. Mouth, mouth. Ah, mouth. Very good. So, mouth. In the mouth, you have your grinders. No? The function of your teeth are to grind it to small pieces. Okay. Now, together with that, there is saliva, secretion of saliva. And in the saliva, you have an enzyme, which is responsible for acting on carbohydrates. And that is your salivary amylase. Mm -hmm. Now, all right, so that's the, sta the start of digestion. You digest it in your mouth. But, uh, you know, we change our, whatever we are told before, you still remember, when you are in the kindergarten, pa, you are told by your teacher to chew your food properly. Diba? Chew your food properly. But it does not, she does not, tells you how many times are you going to chew the food before you swallow it? What do you think would be the number of chewing before swallowing? How many times should you chew your food? Five times. Twenty. Depended. Depends. Well, uh, let's say an average food, because there is food that is, uh, uh, there is plenty of water, oh, like your lugao, favorite of Lini, uh, rubrido, no? Lugao. Diba? Uh, that Anyone can be just know, swallowed that's... right away. Diba? <laughs> but the, the, the average food, you have to chew on it. So it says, you know, the, the book on nutrition says, chew your food 40 times before you swallow it. But I don't think you can go that much 40 times. You just shovel your food into your mouth, chew it once or twice, and then swallow it. Never? Especially when you are attending fiesta. <laughs> okay, so there is a proper way. So make it uh, at least uh, you'll be the one responsible for it. That if it is already watery, that's the time to swallow it, not swallow the whole thing right away that is put into your mouth. You just give it once or twice, and then swallow. Now, <clears throat> reducing the food into smaller uh, portions will help your stomach to digest the food properly. And not only your stomach, your small intestine as well. Okay, so, all right. We have a digestion and absorption occurring in the small intestine. And what are these? From fat, you reduce it into fatty acids and glycerol. For carbohydrate, it is glucose and other monosaccharides. <laughs> and for proteins, amino acids. So they are absorbed into, uh, into the cell and in the cytoplasm. Now, by the way, this compartment here like that is the,
es de mitocondrión. <coughs> While around it, this is the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, you have, for example, glycolysis acting on glucose producing acetyl-CoA and goes inside the mitochondrion. Glycerol as well is converted to acetyl-CoA. Fatty acids, oh, fatty acids can get inside the mitochondrion and acted upon by enzymes of beta oxidation and they form acetyl-CoA. Amino acids as well, it's converted, especially amino acids that are not soluble in water, they usually form right away acetoacetyl, which is ketones, and and also acetyl-CoA, okay? Now acetyl-CoA is the substrate for citric acid cycle. All right, in the citric acid cycle, there is oxidation process. Oxidation process, removal of uh, electrons. And what is usually removed is hydrogen. Because hydrogen was removed, there is also accompanying electrons. And the acceptor is NAD or FAD. So you have now NADH or FADH2. NADH and FADH2 are what is meant by reducing equivalence and so this reducing equivalence now <clears throat> goes into your respiratory chain in the respiratory chain you have several enzymes which the hydrogen passing several enzymes here and then finally, the acceptor of that hydrogen is oxygen to form water. As the hydrogen passes through or the electrons passes through, ATP are formed. Okay, that is from ADP, it becomes ATP. Okay. So, what do you see by this reducing equivalence? No, the reducing equivalence. H or electrons. Citric acid cycle and beta oxidation. The respiratory chain complexes up to four, one, two, three, four, and the machinery of oxidative phosphorylation are all found in the mitochondria. And its ultimate result is the formation of high energy phosphate. Okay. Components of the respiratory chain are contained in four large protein complexes embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So where is that? There you are. <clears throat> so reducing equivalence, 
the first complex, complex one, complex three, complex four, and then you have half oxygen plus hydrogen that is being transferred forms water. Okay. One, three, and four. All right. Complex one gives its hydrogen and electrons to Q. Okay. To Q. What is Q? Coenzyme Q. Okay. CoQ. Quinone. Now, this is NADH. If ADH is usually coming from here, from zoogenic dehydrogenase, the uh, acceptor of hydrogen is FAD or FMN, and then transfer that hydrogen to Q. So it seems that Q here have two feeders, complex one, and complex two. So that's complex two. All right. So this is the central point where hydrogens and electrons pass through from complex one and complex two. Q. Then Q transfer it to complex three. Then cytochrome C. Then complex four. And then out as water, as the oxygen, combining or accepting the hydrogen and it forms water. At the same time, ATP are formed. How is this ATP form? We will talk about it. We have what we call the chemiosmotic theory. Okay. Uh, so these are components, flavoproteins. Flavoproteins uh, are what you call your FMN and FAD. So they come from here. No, the hydrogen is here, is dependent on <clears throat> FAD or FMN. While the dehydrogen is here are dependent on NAD no? or so you have that. <clears throat> okay, so the flavoproteins complex one is with what we call iron sulfur proteins. Iron sulfur proteins. Iron and sulfur components of respiratory chain complex in complex one and complex two okay all right let's go back again from nadh from the outside it is transferred and then you will have if ad here and give it to complex one, no? Okay. And this also FED and FMN going into your coenzyme Q. All right, so flavoproteins of your complexes one and two. Okay. Uh, we will just show you the how this looks like. This is iron and then you have sir, sulfur. Contributor of your sulfur is cysteine. Okay. So this is the simplest. One iron bound with four cysteines. Cysteine, cysteine, cysteine. Letter B, this one, you have two iron, uh, and then you have four cysteine. 
16, 16, 16, 16, 16. And this one is more complex. You have four soul force, four irons, and you have 16, 16, 16, and 16. Okay, so this is just to show you that's iron sulfur proteins. Component of your FED and FMN. Okay, see, Q accepts electrons from complex one and two. We have shown that. And then it says NADH, Q plus five hydrogens. Then the four hydrogens goes into what we call intermembrane. Oh, something like that. Intermembrane space, yeah? <laughs> okay. Intermembrane space. <clears throat> so there you are. Okay, complex one. All right. Q, complex three. No. Complex four. And this is complex two together with this. So where do they get the substrate? So what are the substrate for complex one? We have your pyruvate, citric acid, cycle, and ketone bodies. Okay. For complex one, you have your glycerol phosphate, uh, complex two, glycerol phosphate, succinic dehydrogenase, de succinic acid, and then you have acyl CoA or fatty acid CoA, activated fatty acid. Okay, transfer its hydrogen. No. And you can see hydrogen is extruded. There, there, there. This is, this blue here is your inner membrane. So you must have outer membrane here. In between the outer membrane is intermembrane space where the hydrogens are extruded. Okay? Where your hydrogens are extruded. So what is the function of this hydrogen that is extruded? There. Now we will talk about that, no? Later on. So we'll just look at this first. Complex one, then it goes to complex three, no? Complex four, this one is again complex three, similar to this one, okay? Uh, you have your succinate, the hydrogen is complex two, going there to Q, no? There. All right. <clears throat> oh, here we are now. Okay. All right, there we are. Complex one, complex three, complex four. And then this could have been complex five. You have complex two here. This is complex five, supposedly. Oh, but they don't call it complex five. This is where ATP are formed. You see this? ATP becomes ATP. 
Okay. <clears throat> you have seen this in complex one, complex three and complex four, where hydrogen are extruded. Okay, you see that? So what happens now to this area, the intermembranous space or intermembrane space? It will what be becomes? more positively charged. Oh, more positively charged? More positively charged. And, so what is the, and what is the pH here? Acid or alkaline? Acid. Okay. So you're extruding your hydrogen there. So what happens here? It will be negatively charged. So there is- Very some... good. It becomes very negatively charged. So there what, is have you, um, what have you electrical created? Electrical uh, gradient, doc. Electrochemical oh. gradient. Electrical as well as chemical gradient. Gra electrical, electrochemical gradient. Electrical in the sense that this is positively charged. Positively. This is negatively charged here. Yes. Chemical, okay. because this is acid and this is alkaline, correct? Yes, huh? doc. Yes, All doc. right. So you are created an electrochemical gradient. And we cannot, and tissues cannot withstand that. If you create a clear, uh, it has to be resolved. So what would be the resolution of this? Hydrogen ions doc, will flow down through the atheism well, phase. So we'll have to go back. Go, go back okay. through the atheism phase. The problem here is from where they come out, the hydrogen from where they come out, they cannot go back. That this is a one-way street. So there must be a way that these protons here will go back. And this is provided by your F proteins. F. The F protein has to segment. One here, which is inside, is F1, and is outside, F0. Now, that cannot be retained, or no? not, not easy to retain, F1 and F0. But if you change this to Fi, which I is similar to one, I means inside, and zero, call it O, and that means outside. Diba? So your F protein has an inside and an outside portion or component. So when there is a flux already of hydrogen here, this opens and all the hydrogen came rushing out there. And your enzyme synthetase or in, uh, ATP synthase is located in the F1 or FI. And once the hydrogen passes through, no, it activates your ATP synthase. And in the presence of EDP and inorganic phosphate, the energy here will be supplied to the inorganic phosphate. So that becomes high energy phosphate combined with ADP to form ATP. And you resolve the electrochemical gradient. Correct? But still, there's plenty of reducing equivalence going in here. So this will continue. Hydrogen extruded, hydrogen coming in back, producing ATP. So the cycle goes on. Did you get it? 
what I was describing, what I was describing is this one, the chemio-osmotic theory of oxidative phosphorylation. Complex one and complex complex three and complex four are proton pumps. It pumps out the protons. There. They act as proton pumps. Now, once you have so much of protons here, it goes back. There. <clears throat> okay. So that is how you get your card. So this is now your oh gibale na sa nituaron unta ni. This is this is the inside and this is the outside. This is your F protein. Ah, uh, F protein. So this is the F O outside and this is the F I. The FI is where you have your ATP synthase. Huh? So when hydrogen goes in, this turns around. And you have an axle here, which is bent axle. As you can see, this is the gamma protein. There, oh, the gamma. La hosna dia. And then you have three alpha subunits, three alpha subunits, one, two, and three. All three beta subunits, one, two, and three. ADP and organic phosphates no, enters into your beta subunit and out as ATP. Okay, so there you are. ADP captures in the form of high energy phosphate, significant portion of free energy release by catabolic processes, resulting ATP has been called the energy currency of the cell because it passes on this free energy to drive those processes requiring energy. So we have to have control of this to ensure a constant supply of ATP. So these are the controls. There are five states. State one, availability of ADP and substrate that gives off electrons or hydrogen and electrons. State two, this is a control. So if you control the availability of ADP and substrate together, that is state one. But if you only control the substrate, you have state two. State three is the capacity of respiratory chain itself. So if there's nothing wrong with the uh, chain, so ATP formation will go on. But if there is something wrong, or if you add something to stop the transfer of electrons, then you can control it here. That is state three. And state four is availability of ADP only. This is different from here because this is two compounds are needed, ADP and substrate. And the last is availability of oxygen. Because you will not have the final acceptor of hydrogen and electrons if you do not have this. So this is the conditions for the rate limiting, you know, uh, limiting the respiration, respiratory control.
All right. Many poisons inhibit the respiratory chain. And what are these poisons? Okay. Now here, this is succinate dehydrogenase, converting succinate to fumarate. And malonate competes for the catalytic site of succinate dehydrogenase because malonate looks like succinate. Okay, now, <clears throat> so this is complex two, FED, transferring that hydrogen to, hydrogen and electrons to coenzyme Q can be inhibited by this, carboxyl and TTFA. The TTFA is a, uh, iron chelating agent, oh, an iron chelating agent. All right. Pyrecidine, amobarbital, and rotinone can inhibit this complex one and complex, complex one and Q. Okay. Pyrecidine A is an antibiotic, amobarbital is a barbiturate, rotinone is a face poison. Okay. All right. Now this complex three can be inhibited by, oh, excuse me. Okay, Nalubat. Okay, we have here Ball, British anti levicide And this is Antimycin A, another antibiotic, which can inhibit this. Complex three. Complex four can be inhibited by a known poison, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, and cyanide. Okay, now, <clears throat> the transfer of electrons or ion and hydrogen in the respiratory chain is what we call as respiration. Okay, respiration. Uh, to the respiration, is a coupled reaction known as phosphorylation. Phosphorylation of ADP. You add a phosphate to form ATP. You add a phosphate, no, you form ATP. You add a phosphate, you form ATP. Okay. All right. So phosphorylation is coupled to is coupled to respiration. Okay? Coupled to respiration. So these two reactions. Now, we have compounds that can uncouple respiration from uh, phosphorylation or phosphorylation from respiration. So we call them uncouplers. So there are many uncouplers. One uncoupler is 2,4-dinitrophenol or 2,4-DNP. No? Okay. Now this one can prevent oligomycin 
can prevent the phosphorylation of ADP to become ATP. So oligomycin, another antibiotic, which are useful against uh, microbes or microorganism, but it cannot be used because it will affect also our cells. Now? Okay. Barbiturates or okay, we have that, amobarbital, antimycin A, antibiotic, dimercaprol, all right. Hydrogen 5, malonate, uh, atratiloside inhibits phosphorylation, inhibits phosphorylation by trans inhibiting the transporter of ADP. Oligomycin completely blocks oxidation and phosphorylation by blocking the flow of protons through ATP synthase. Okay. Now, we need to have what we call transporters because if you remember, we said that your uh, mitochondrion has two membranes, outer and inner membrane. An outer membrane uh, is not, uh, is permeable, no, it's permeable. But the inner membrane is not. It is selectively, uh, permeability is selective. And that would require the presence of transporters that will transport. You have seen that, no? Uh, Symport, antiport, neba? Right? Okay. Look at this. <clears throat> Now the substrate pyruvate. No. Cannot pass through, no? Look at that. And these are this is your inhibitor. There. Now the the coming in of ADP to become ATP an ATP an ATP uh, exiting out is prevented by atractiloside. So that's your antiport. So this is your transporter here, transporter six. No? So look at all other uh, transporter. This is antiport again, alpha ketoglutarate come in, malate goes out. Then you have citrate going in, malate goes out. Malate comes in, biphosphate comes out. Huh? So, Pyruvate going in together with protons. Phosphoric acid coming in or phosphate comes in and OH goes out. Huh? So this is inhibited by this. All right, so we have these transporters, phosphate transporter, pyruvate transporter, dicarboxylate transporter, tricarboxylic acid transporter, alpha ketoglutarate transporter, adenine nucleotide transporter, ADP and ATP, no? Okay. So uncouplers, we have this. 
uh, one of the uncouplers that I mentioned already is uh, 2,4-dinitrophenol. Now, uh, thermogenin or the uncoupling protein. Now, thermogenin is found in brown adipose tissue. So what is this brown adipose tissue? This brown adipose tissue are, are, are present in animals that hibernate. Animals that hibernate are usually are in uh, very cold countries because during winter, they hide and sleep during the winter. And as we said, remember your exergonic and intergonic. The unused uh, heat or energy oh, is converted to heat. So this is the use of thermogenin for, for that. A brown adipose tissue so that this adipose tissue you know, uncouples phosphorylation from respiration. It uncouples so there is no ATP formation so there is the energy is converted to heat. So this therefore is beneficial for those animals that hibernate or sleep during winter to keep their body warm. That's thermogenin, brown adipose tissue. We have brown adipose tissue when <clears throat> during our birth, now when we uh, are born into this world, so in order to prepare us from coldness, so we have brown adipose tissue. But as you grow older, that brown adipose tissue disappears or just dissolve. Huh? So babies have brown adipose tissue. Ah, uh, the chemiosmotic theory. We mentioned it already, diba? Proton translocation, or oh, there you are. So this is the outside here. This is the inside. This is the Fi protein, and this is the Fo protein. Fi, inside Fo. You have your ATP synthesis here. So, there is hydrogen coming in there as a result of the hydrogen extruded out by complex one, three, and four. So this hydrogen comes in, activates your ATP synthase. So your ADP that comes in through a transporter there plus the inorganic phosphate, which has now the energy, high energy phosphate bond, combines with ADP to form ATP, and ATP now goes out to be used in the other uh, <clears throat> processes that would require energy. Okay. At your chemo osmotic theory. Pro, pro, proton translocating transhydrogenase is a source of intramitochondrial NADPH. Okay, now ionophores. What are these ionophores? Remember, when hydrogen was pumped out, by the proton pump, complex one, complex three, and complex four, 
that hydrogen cannot go back from where they came from through complex one, complex three, and complex four. They have to go back to a certain area, which we call the F protein. So the F protein there allows the hydrogen to come back, okay? But ionophores, they are lipophilic molecules. So what do you mean by lipophilic? They are lipid material. And membranes are lipid layers. So they can pass through. No? They can pass through. And usually these ionophores bring with them cations. They bring with them cations. And that is, one of that is valinomycin, which brings potassium ions. So if they penetrate the mitochondrion, bringing in potassium, which is positively charged, no? That will make the, you, you destroy what you call your electrochemical gradient because you have a positive ion that comes in. Because valinomycin carries potassium. And another one is ditro, dinitrophenol. Oh. They are proton ionophores, proton ionophores. Okay, so you destroy the formation of ATP because the formation of ATP depends upon the coming back of the protons through your F protein. Because in the F protein, you have your ATP synthase. The, the on rushing of the protons activates your ATP synthase to form ATP out of ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay. Now, the NED and if ED inside the mitochondrion cannot go out. If AD and NAD cannot go out of the mitochondrion, they are formed there. And if you remember, most of the reducing equivalent are formed in the cytoplasm, the cytosol, you see? Now this NAD here and FAD cannot pass through your inner membrane. It cannot pass through outer and inner. So what we have are what we call shuttles. So this NAD it's form here in the cytoplasm can only give its reducing equivalents, the hydrogen protons, by converting the hydroacetone phosphate to glycerol 3-phosphate through your enzyme, glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Removing the hydrogen here, giving it to dihydroxyacetone phosphate to become glycerol 3-phosphate. Glycerol 3-phosphate has uh, what you call a transporter. So it can get inside. Once it gets inside, the glycerol 3-phosphate is acted upon by an enzyme, glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, 
which is located only in the mitochondrion. This one is located in the cytoplasm. So you have two similar enzymes, but this one stays in the cytoplasm. This one stays in the mitochondrion. So the glycerol triphosphate is now acted by this dehydrogenase, the hydrogen given off to FED to become FEDH2, and it goes to your respiratory chain. And wait a minute. And then the dihydroxyacetone, which is oxidized, goes out because of this transporter here, which is antiport. Okay. Now, we remember that there are three places in the respiratory chain where we have ATP formation, complex one, complex two, and complex three. Okay. Now, where will this FED is to connect to the respiratory chain? What particular area? Complex two. Coenzyme Q. CoQ. Okay. That's complex two, it goes down to CoQ. CoQ. Anio bypass complex one, deba. Right? And complex one is supposed to have ATP formation there. You have F proteins there also. Okay. So this means that you will only form ATP from complex three and complex four. So you will just have more or less two sites. So there is less. ATP formation when FAD is the acceptor of protons and electrons in the respiratory chain. Now, uh, what happens now? We need to have a uh, acceptor in AD here. No? So we look at it this way. So this time, what do we have? NAD. NAD also from here. Okay. So NADH gives its hydrogen to oxaloacetate, becomes malate. Malate comes in. Malate is again dehydrogenated, but the acceptor is NAD instead of FAD. So you have NADS. So you start from complex one. So you'll have more ATP that will be formed. Did you get it? Hmm? Not be overwhelmed by this, you just follow oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is being aminated by glutamate. So it becomes aspartic acid. It can go out and aspartic acid. You give the amino group to oxalo, to, uh, to, to alpha ketoglutarate here, and then becomes glutamate. Now then oxalo acid goes again like that as phthalate. And then glutamate comes in because this is antiport, aspartic acid out, glutamic acid in. Okay. So malate shuttle. This is the malate shuttle. The other one is you have your glycerophosphate shuttle. Glycerophosphate shuttle. <coughs> so we have creatine phosphate 
Uh, by the way, ION Transport is uh, energy link. Oh. So active transport yan. So potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, and phosphate. A primary proton pump drives cut ion exchange. All right, creatine phosphate shuttle facilitates transport of high energy phosphate from mitochondria. So we have creatine phosphate. Where do you find creatine phosphate? Muscles, skeletal muscles, heart muscles. So you have creatine phosphate there. Okay, so we have creatine phosphate shuttle. Uh, this looks complicated, but this is very, very simple. If you look at it. So what does we have here? This is outer membrane. This is inner membrane of the mitochondrion. This is the entire membrane space. Remember? All right. So oxidative phosphorylation of ADP forms ATP. So we have here CKM, creatine kinase in the mitochondrion. And then it goes this way. No. All right. And creates creatine phosphate from creatine and ATP. CK, C, cytosolic. Ah. All right. So there you are. So creatine phosphate can be used by muscle contra contraction. So it gives that phosphate. ADP gets that phosphate, becomes ATP used for that. And you have your and you have your creatine going back again with ATP and creatine phosphate going out. No? So it's just a cycle going in, out, or creatine can be phosphorylated through glycolytic ATP or from mitochondrial ATP. Now what we have here are pores. No? Pore. That's a pore there. Okay. Clinical aspect. Oh, so this one is fatal, infantile, mitochondrial, myopathy, and renal dysfunction through what we call MELAS. Mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke is an inherited condition due to NADHQ oxidoreductase complex one, or it could be the cytochrome oxidase found in complex four. So there is mutation here, complex four and complex one. NADHQ oxidoreductase and the cytochrome oxidase. Mutation in the mitochondrial DNA and may be involved in Alzheimer's disease, diabetes mellitus, uh, and a number of drugs and poisons act by inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. Here you are, so you have your milas. As we said, genetic disorders are not common. So imagine this, mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke. And this occurs in infants. So, of course, infants are born like this. They could not live long. 
you will just die. Because there is renal dysfunction, mitochondrial myopathy. Oh, thank you for attending. <laughs> okay. So we have finished respiratory chain. No. Uh, another teacher will uh, be with you. To... No question, po. Yes. Um, uh, ma confirm la po, Doc, if an complex 3 and 4 la add to an my F protein no. and my ATP synthase they, they, or they have, complex? They have, they have. Oh, they have? have. Ah, okay. They have 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, 3, 4. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Uh, one, one, three, uh, 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. Oh, okay, that's Doc. why complex 1, complex 3, and complex 4 can form ATP because of that we just separated that uh, uh the text separated that a protein because if you are going to put it there in the, where there is extrusion of uh what you call these protons then they will just come back well that is actually what is happening now so they just show one one area one one uh, illustration of the F protein. So okay, without doctor. the F protein, if without the F protein, no ATP can form. And they said complex one, complex three, and complex four can form ATP. Okay. Okay, doc. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's call it a day. You have another uh, teacher there. Thank you, Doc. Welcome. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Welcome. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Hi, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc.